Everyone, please find a seat. We'll start the program momentarily. Can everyone please find a seat. Good evening. I'm John Miko, the executive director of the Union League Legacy Foundation. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Jack Templeton Liberty Series. As you know, the Legacy Foundation is the nonprofit charity of the Union League of Philadelphia. And all through the year, we use the history, the values, the great collections of the Union League for all kinds of programs that speak to who we are and what the Union League is all about. And what we're about is about that first line in our bylaws. It's also about what Calvin Coolidge was about, the Constitution and free enterprise. So we have a really special program on that tonight. Um, just a few housekeeping items, if you would please turn off your cell phone or at least silence it. We do have a Q&A portion. I understand we had some problems with the, uh, the code with some of them. I do have plenty of questions though, so don't be uh, worried from both you and others. Um, so we will have Q&A, but we're not gonna be taking it directly uh, from the audience. The program will be about an hour in total. Um, and as always, uh, we thank you for being here. We thank you for your support. Everything that we do is made possible through the generous voluntary contributions from league members, whether it's our uh, civics education programs, our scholarship programs, lectures like tonight, uh, the care of the collections, all of that happens because of your generosity. And I thank you very much for it. And now to introduce our program is the chair of the education uh, committee for the Union League Legacy Foundation, Mr. Steve Target, Steve. Well, thank you, John. Um, it's my great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Ms. Amity Schles. Amity is the author of four New York Times bestsellers, The Forgotten Man, A New History of the Great Depression, The Forgotten Man Graphic, a full-length illustrated version of the same book, Coolidge, a full-length biography of the 30th president, and The Greedy Hand, How Taxes Drive Americans Crazy. I think we can appreciate that. She's also the author of A Great Society, A New History, a comprehensive account of the Johnson administration's most notable legacy. Many of you know Ms. Schles from the Wall Street Journal, where she served on the editorial board, writing on foreign policy, taxation, and other topics, or from the Financial Times and Bloomberg, each of which carried her syndicated column over the years. Currently, Amity uh, appears in print in Forbes and the National Review. She chairs the board of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation, a national foundation based on the birthplace of Calvin Coolidge. The foundation's goal is to share Coolidge with Americans by hosting debate and events at the Coolidge site and through newer media. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Amity Schles. Can you hear me? Very well. I'll say thank you in the middle. I didn't forget. I'm oh, oh. 
right now it's a, a certain moment, the first half of the year before the presidential election and everyone is talking about the candidates, what will happen, will President Biden run, will Gaz Gavin Newsom be a candidate, will Ron DeSantis run, um, will President Trump come back, and which of these men or ladies, maybe Nikki Haley, maybe who has character that's a, and um that's the the extent of the discussion um we know character is king you remember that peggy noonan book about president reagan but what we don't talk about um is what the candidate will do and whether he or she has done work with colleagues what the party will do uh, which defined projects we talk about names not platform the reliance on candidates over platform places us citizens in a precarious position. If, for example, we make the sole criterion for political reform or change one person, what happens when that person slips up? Oh, scandal. Since we have no platform, the character is all and the scandal is fatal. And the voters are left with nothing. This um, is a suboptimal situation. Uh, I, I think it's wrong to rely on man or woman. Men and women are fallible. So tonight I'd like to tell you a story a party about a party uh, you might have heard of that did put platform first in a certain instance a century ago and about how that simple commitment to platform even over individual benefited the nation, even citizens who didn't vote for said platform. So it's a story about how a strong and consistent platform can restore political trust, prosperity, um, perhaps even an era as that starts out, that commences as cynically as our own. Um, the star of my story, and you think I'm going to say Calvin Coolidge, but it isn't quite, is the Republican platform of 1920, 100 years ago. Secondary are the players um, in the play on the political stage. And you're right now, and I know this is a Coolidge stronghold and I'm aware of Calvin in the next room listening to me and Andrew. Um, the 1920 platform, wait a minute, Amity, you're supposed to be the Coolidge biographer, do your duty. Presidential biographers are essentially hagiographers, right? It's all about Coolidge. Um, why did you not mention Calvin first? Are you saying Calvin is not important? Are you shirking your duty, you biograph biographer heretic, right? But so I ask you, because this is a wise, well-read, serious audience with some knowledge of the subject to bear with me, because the 1920 platform only became American law and led to the prosperity that it did because certain people were willing to work, to craft and fight for it. For two, five, even 10 years, these men worked to get to implementation and there Calvin Coolidge did pay a role. And what I want to say about Coolidge, maybe because I was at Villanova Law today, but I think you will also understand is the way one plays a role in the fate of the United States also has to do with one's trade, which in Calvin Coolidge's case happened to be the law. He was a lawyer and actually a specific kind of lawyer, which is to say a contracts lawyer. And that knowledge, in addition to being a Massachusetts politician and so on, made his contribution especially valuable. So it's a good story. It takes a minute to tell. And I'm very grateful to be at the Union League and with you and to be a guest of this group and near Calvin tonight. And I wanna say thank you to Mr. Miko who worked very hard to arrange it. Thank you for the time it will take me to tell this. And in order to give the best president in the history of the United States his due, I will start with his biography and even Coolidge's birthplace. Um, Coolidge comes from uh, you could say Coolidge comes from Tocqueville, Vermont, actually he comes from Plymouth, Vermont, but he comes from a town uh, that of the kind 
Alexis de Tocqueville described, where you could say Coolidge came from contract Vermont because everyone in Vermont where Coolidge came from in Plymouth honored um, his deals and lived up to his words. Um, this was a village, Plymouth. Ha has anyone been to Plymouth here? It, it's a little beauty and we hope you come this summer to see it at the Coolidge Centennial. Um, it was a village of scarcely thousand people. Um, it was on a high hill. Um, the road that led up to it washed out very often, fewer than a thousand people living more or less in isolation. In this village, first impression that didn't matter, marketing didn't matter because everyone knew everyone very well and remembered everything anyone ever, the others ever did. There was no tricking your friends. So of course they tried to live up to their promises in Plymouth. And that is the culture Coolidge grew up with. His father ran the town store. He was known as Colonel John. Um, he tried to run that store in a way that helped himself and helped the village. And he understood that business could do that, Father John. If you're interested, the store uh, spent about $10,000 a year and netted about $100 a month. So those of you who are good in arithmetic can see that the return was not very great. Fidelity would fail us if our uh, retirement accounts gave that rate. But nonetheless, um, part of that was he he loved his neighbor's father, John. He, he sold a lot on credit. Um, and I'll read you what Coolidge said of his father in the village. He trusted nearly everybody, but lost a surprisingly small amount. Sometimes people he knew at from the town at the store would come back to the store years later and pay the whole bill. That was Plymouth. The Coolidge's were not poor like Lincoln's, um, to whom Coolidge, Lincoln is to whom Coolidge is often compared, but life in Plymouth did involve a struggle. The railroads in the 19th century went everywhere. Um, the world overinvested in railroads, except Plymouth. The road, the grade was too steep, the population too sparse. The agriculture department of the New Deal, double shame, went to Plymouth and declared that scarce an acre in that town, the USDA said, was even arable. All you could do was, you know, dairy like that sap, sugar, which is why Coolidge was such a protectionist. Sugar, dairy, and um, at one point, Colonel John, the father, got up a cheese factory, which you could visit if you go to the Notch now, to Plymouth Notch. But you have to ask yourself, what is a cheese factory? When there is no electricity, no refrigeration, and no train to take your perishables, to market what a cheese factory is, is an exercise in economic desperation. That was Coolidge boyhood. Um, and Calvin himself was no uh, exact, not a show off. You know, the nickname Silent Cal boyhood in the 1870s and 1880s. This silence gave him an advantage. He learned a little more than other people. He didn't, the Coolidge's didn't slop over to use a New England phrase. He kept to himself. He observed the political process in the town and there was a Democrat in the town and his father was always polite to him. And when they debated the snow tax or who would take care of the school teacher they took turns and you didn't know which party was which. That was Plymouth, that was what created him. When this young man arrives at college, 119 pounds, or actually to be precise, 119.5 pounds, he's small and skinny, right? Coolidge, Amherst, that's where he went, Amherst, down the valley. Um, the other students saw Calvin Coolidge. They observed him. They saw him where? In chapel, in Greek class, at the boarding house table, but they didn't see much in Coolidge. He was just another boy. He was dying, aching to be tapped for a fraternity. And Amherst at that time was intensely Greek. He was passed over 
in his freshman year, a lonely man during rush. Um, and if you go to the student paper of Amherst, which I did in research for the book, you'll see every name but Calvin Coolidge in that darn paper. I think it's called the Amherst Student. Eventually, at College Coolidge got a name a little bit as a debater. Um, he found his footing debating. Uh, and by the fourth year, he was tapped by a new fraternity, Phi Gamma Delta, who recently joined the Coolidge Foundation in Washington for a party. So uh, that was all right, but still a fairly minor character on campus. I think his obscurity was willed obscurity, and we all have been like that or know people like that. The year um, they graduated at Amherst, the seniors were always asked in a poll who they were and what they were going to do. And Coolidge's friend Dwight Morrow, as, as in Anne Morrow Lindbergh, um, put law or study law. And Coolidge's acquaintance Harlan Fisk Stone, uh, another time, put law. They were going to Columbia University for law school. Yet when Calvin Coolidge of the class of 1895 was asked to write what he would do after college, he put nothing. We all know children like that. Coolidge did not go to Columbia Law or the law school um, in the state where he went to college, Harvard, to the Coolidge family. Again, not poor, but without much money to spare, that's farming. Law school looked like an expensive proposition, but Coolidge did not do nothing either after college. He articled himself to a law firm in the county seat Hampshire County, Northampton, Mass, where Smith College is, the law firm was called Hammond and Field. And Coolidge read law, and that was like Lincoln before him. That is, he studied at night and worked by day on writs, deeds, and contracts, uh, and sat the bar um, after a period uh, of learning. Th this little factoid that Coolidge didn't go to Harvard Law and he didn't go to Columbia with his friends, but instead stayed home, so to speak, matters. Because as you know, by the 1890s, a new movement in law was becoming popular at the law schools, legal realism. In 1897, or around the time Coolidge was sitting for the bar exam in Northampton, the scholar and attorney and future Supreme Court Justice, Oliver Wendell Holmes, gave a speech called The Path of the Law, essentially about the social obligations of lawyers and judges, thinking of it as a sort of early Robert Kennedy. That um, And Justice Holmes said, um, and, and this, this speech was the basis for the legal revolution of the 20th century, Justice Holmes said, I think judges themselves have failed adequately to recognize their duty of weighing considerations of social advantage. That is, let's evaluate society when we judge and judge on those terms. He said, those jurors who believe in natural law, which is respect for something higher than the Supreme Court, are in a naive state, seem to be in a naive state of mind that accepts what has been familiar, their old hat, their old people. Um, Holmes did not believe that law was, as it said, to be discovered. He said, common law is not a brooding omnipresence in the sky. And we can not imagine how different that was, but it was very different, especially to what Calvin was learning in Northampton. There he was in Forbes Library in Northampton, studying under the Guastavino tile of the beautiful library, a Carnegie style library. And the texts he was reading were probably older editions of say Kent's commentaries, which were the ones not edited by Oliver Wendell Holmes or legal realists, and he was studying, he, he, I'm sure he knew and heard also from his teacher, Garmin, that maybe there was a higher authority beyond certain judges, and that maybe there were things that the law could not do for men. By temperament too, the young Coolidge was fairly traditional, more solicitor, and bar more solicitor than barrister, the UK people would say, more of a settler, more of a compromiser, more incremental, not flamboyant. He didn't want to rewrite laws. He wanted to know the law well and help his client navigate existing statute. 
you've heard the story perhaps about um, Coolidge was very uh, ec economic. He economized with words even then. Um, and he tried to give his opinion in as few words as possible. And he outdid himself in a case relating to a man who happened to die in a boat on a lake. And the issue arose, might the body be moved even to the next jurisdiction? And what, how would that affect what the estate of the man and so on? And the, the, the family came running to the office of Hammond and Field and there was Calvin and to ask him, might they move the body of their late friend? And Coolidge in this, in this instance trimmed from four words to three, he said, can move body. I'm dropping the pronoun at the beginning. And the grown up partner there said, usually when he says something, it's right. And we know this is part of who he was as a lawyer, too. If you are a lawyer and you talk long, you bill long, right? And Coolidge needed clients. So if he got a reputation of costing less by talking less, well, that was his comparative advantage, wasn't it? And he was alert to that um, taciturnity as comparative advantage. What else about Coolidge and what kind of lawyer he was? I'll tell you a story from the end of his life, but it could have held in the beginning. And it, it's one I tell uh, business school students at NYU Stern, and they don't get it. So see if you do. Um, Coolidge, uh, Coolidge had a contract post-presidency, very grand ex-president, right? 10 articles. $2,000 each, 1930 dollars, um, with Collier's Magazine, 10 articles, $2,000 each. He was going to buy his first home that he paid for, the beaches. That was the nugget for the house, 10 articles, 2000 He sends in the 10 articles, um, and what happens? Collier's, the magazine, publishes only six. What happens next? You think poor editor. Of course, former president summons editor, meet me at the Vanderbilt Hotel. Poor editor. They come together. And indeed, the president says the very lines that the poor editor fears. You contracted for 10 articles, but you published only six. What does the editor say in such a circumstance? And all business school and all students, I think, know this. But we paid you. We paid you for all, all 10 articles. So what do you care, right? But we paid you, defense. And Coolidge did something. This is the part that surprises the students. Pulled out a check already written and signed, Calvin Coolidge, for $8,000. The slid it across the table to Collier's Magazine, unpublished articles. And when I do tell this story to students, they go berserk. He's a sucker. Contract says, contract says, yes, the contract said. That's not what Coolidge was undoing or contesting. Um, what Coolidge was saying, and this is true of a young man in Northampton as well, is I suspect something wasn't right about those four articles because you were originally commissioned 10, and then you only publish six. Well, there's no getting around. I did not deliver what you, the client, wanted, a businessman. Therefore, I'll give you back the money. Why? Why would he do that? He's not just a sucker. He wanted to stand well in the eyes of Collier's if he were kind to Collier's and appreciated Collier's and showed, frankly, moral behavior. Maybe Collier's would want to do business with him again. And that was his Coolidge's rule of life, and not just in the village of Plymouth, but also, say, trading commodities in London. Think of the most anonymous transaction you can come up with. Everyone knows everyone, and everyone remembers everything. And we must always remember that as we do business and honor our deals and keep our friends on top of that. So that was sort of the Coolidge policy as an attorney, even as a very young man in Northampton, under promise, over deliver, be friendly. Those principles he took over into politics, town offices, alderman, clerk, 
Uh, Western Massachusetts, where he was at the turn of the century, was industrial. Uh, there are many new immigrants in town, Germans, Italians, German brewers. This lawyer, young man with red hair, now about 130 pounds, wooed these new Americans as clients and constituents, Irish cobblers. And they would, they knew, they learned that he would do what he said and not rook them. Um, over the course of the first decades of the 1900s, the voters of Massachusetts rewarded Coolidge, the contracts lawyer, for that policy in politics of trust and decency and sent him sort of straight up the political ladder. From they, Coolidge held more offices than at any president I can find. Maybe you can correct me. He was in the town government. He was in the state legislature. He was in the state Senate. He was mayor of Northampton. He was clerk, then he was lieutenant governor, and eventually governor, just straight up. Um, Coolidge stayed the same in this period, which goes up to about 1918, 1919, but the world around him did not. By the early teens, the political parties were in turmoil, um, especially the Republican Party looming over it all was Theodore Roosevelt, who, is he here? Where's Theodore? Okay walked away and created the Bull Moose Party, which was dramatic. And another night, I, you've had, I'm sure you've had many TR speakers, um, and, um, but was devastating from the point of view of the party. Um, Coolidge, uh, as a local politician, wanted the Republicans, which happened to be his party, to win. Um, in Massachusetts, Republicans had always won since 1856, but in 1912, they did not when there were three parties. And of course, as you know, Woodrow Wilson, with a plurality, the Democrat beat the Republicans and the Bull Moose combined. Um, and uh, Coolidge, you can read his diaries, was mighty confused about the whole thing and uh, too very polite, but I gather did not approve. Um, President Wilson and Congress, joined by progressive Republicans, by the way, saw through a raft of new progressive laws in the teens, prohibition, suffrage for women, the introduction of the income tax, less discussed, but perhaps interesting to this audience, uh, the passage of the 17th Amendment, changing to a more democratic fashion the way the U.S. Senate is selected, what did Coolidge say? Not much very often, but he did give one speech um, in 1914 to his fellow senators when he was elected president of the Senate, uh, a wonderful speech uh, which showed his growing hesitation about progressivism. He said, maybe there are too many laws we're passing. Give administration a chance to catch up with legislation before you pass another law. Don't expect to help the weak by pulling down the strong. Perhaps money flows down from great factories. That is our experience. That is don't vilify automatically great factories. And then this line, which is really a rebuttal to Holmes, Men do not make laws, they do but discover them. Oliver Wendell Holmes just or Brandeis may not have noticed, uh, but the senators of Massachusetts in the general court certainly did. Their president didn't really like big reforming laws and they pulled in their sails a bit, right? So it was an influential speech. By the time Coolidge was elected governor in 1918, not just the GOP, but the country was in turmoil post-crisis, sort of a similar situation to now. First of all, there had been the crisis of the war, which led to great debt. Uh, taxes were already so high, 77% top marginal rate, that it, there was no use raising them any higher. The revenues were quite disappointing. It was said business was just not working at all. There was this so-called capital strike kind of reminds you of uh, certain authors we know a capital strike um tens of thousands of veterans were returning in coolidge by the way welcomed them in boston harbor with big bullhorn welcome to massachusetts 
dear veterans. He didn't say welcome home to the United States. He said, welcome to Massachusetts. That's what a federalist he was. Um, and many of those veterans were wounded and, as, and their legs were festering. And as you know, there were no antibiotics. So it was a, a bleak outlook for veterans. Uh, some other similarities, the dollar didn't buy what people expected it would. The government uh, was, was saying uh, it was the fault of the supply chain that prices were too high. Mm -hmm. um, and um, workers therefore were angry justifiably. Um, and there was for a long time that giant on the political horizon until 1919 when he passed. Where is Theodore? I feel like I look, Theodore. So as a freshman governor of Massachusetts in 1918, Coolidge had to deal with crises. Um, the, he found his footing by leading, leaning on his trade, which is the law, and he stuck to the law. Um, around that time, the Volstead Act, which is the statute that goes along with prohibition was passed. And many of Coolidge's constituents who were brewers, um, got up a piece of legislation to console themselves and save their businesses that they maybe could make near beer and that that would be legal under the Volstead Act. Uh, and they'd wait and see, you know, kind of a mischievous and also desperate piece of legislation, frankly, for brewers. Um, what did Governor Coolidge say about that, um, this desperation of his constituents? He vetoed it and I will read it to you. I am opposed to the practice of legislative deception. It is better to proceed with candor. We don't know what's going to happen. The Supreme Court is going to hear the Volstead Act and so on. Wait until the Supreme Court of the United States talks. That is, let's not lie to ourselves about the law. Prohibition might be terrible law. It was, but it was the law at that time, so we must respect it. The second Coolidge gubernatorial crisis uh, inspired Ronald Reagan, uh, or at least the behavior of Coolidge, uh, involved the police of Boston, who by a quirk of law reported up the line to the governor's office. The police too were Coolidge's constituents, largely Irish. Their contract said no strikes, um, but they had multiple grievances after World War I. Their station houses were full of rats. Indeed, when a helmet was on the shelf, the rats chewed on the leather part of it. They were vastly underpaid due to the unacknowledged inflation, um, vastly underpaid, and there were no colas or anything like that in those days, no adjustments. Um, they worked too many hours and they had to share their cots and take turns sleeping in with them. Mainly though, it was the pay and they decided the only way they could get the attention of the police commissioner or a level or two down from Coolidge was indeed to go on strike. And why the heck not everyone else in the world was going on in strike, right? Europe, 1919, turmoil. Well, we can have a few strikes here. And, and when they finally did walk out in September, 1919, most citizens expected Coolidge would conciliate. After all, the police were his supporters. Um, in those days, the governor of Massachusetts had a rigorous work because the term was only one year. So Coolidge was running again that fall for a second term. Um, there were riots in Boston. The windows of the great department stores were broken. The shoes were stolen. I told you there's some parallels to today. And the trouble was so bad that Coolidge had to call out the state guard. And the police judged that this turmoil and this crime and this looting would only strengthen their case because Coolidge, the governor, would be desperate to restore peace in Boston. He would cut a deal. The police expected that, but they expected wrong. Coolidge would not conciliate. The strikers were fired not to be rehired and Coolidge issued a kind of categoric line. There is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, any time. The basis for this argument again is contract. You had to honor the contract and you had to maintain, he had a fiduciary duty to maintain public safety. 
Round about then, the run up to the 1920 election, the Republican Party was still split and had to make a choice about its own direction. And this is where it's different from today. Roosevelt had passed away, but new progressives were staking their claim on the party, firming up a progressive agenda, federal benefits for veterans, the beginning of what we call entitlements, government control of resources like oil or railroads, expansion of the state, maybe control of water power, for example. This was the new direction for the party, and to many, it looked like the future. A second choice for the direction of the Republican Party, the party could stick to tradition, smaller government, tariffs, low income tax, federalism, respect for business. This was actually the less popular option and many charged it was a kind of desperate retreat into the 19th century, too retro. The stakes couldn't be higher because the Republicans knew if they didn't go progressive, there'd be three parties and there'd be that election situation. The party leaders, and here's the difference, they met and met. They also polled every Republican. If you go back and look what the Republican National Committee did, and this is a club that was founded um, in part, you know, out of the tradition of the Republican Party and its goals, they polled thousands and thousands of members of the party as to what they should do and weighed the question and had large committees and wrote a book about the direction of the party pro and con. And I have this book and I wanted to see how big it was. So I put it on the table and I put two double stuff Oreos next to it on one on top of the other. And this book is tall, thicker, that is the spine than two double stuff Oreos to give you an idea. And they shift it all to the party leadership, which thought and decided it would go for the traditional option. That is withdrawing the government hand from natural resources and key industries, lower taxes, federalism, reduction of debt. And essentially though the language was different, not establishing what we would call entitlements. This was a rough commitment, um, but it was there more or less first. And only then were the candidates picked. They came second. So the sort of image you have from the school books about the 1920 convention that it was all about the Blackstone Hotel and the smoke-filled room. Yes, uh, but I think it was all about the platform and the candidates turned out to be Senator Warren Harding of Ohio. He was picked because of the platform. He was known, he was kind of like Lyndon Johnson Harding, master of the Senate, a guy who could get legislation through the Senate. And that was very important. So Republicans wanted to lower the taxes from a top marginal rate of 77 or 73 to 25. Um, he, Harding could do that. And then Coolidge would stand for law and restraint and certainly federalism. They, they picked a team that went with the plan they had chosen, the contract. Normalcy, which is the phrase for the 1920 par platform of the GOP, is an awkward term. I don't know about you, but when I looked at that, I said, is that part Latin and part Greek? What is that? You know, normalcy, what a weird, weird word. But all they meant by that was return to the traditions of America, return to respect for business, return to uh, the way it was in many ways pre-war. The country voted for normalcy, however awkward the name, in a landslide 1920. And I think of that election as an election as much about platform as about men. 21, Harding's in, and he does do some, goes a long way. Uh, next year, you have the Harding revisionist here, I hope. Um, goes a long way to fulfilling the platform. First of all, he hired the world's best finance man, Andrew Mellon of Pennsylvania, to, uh, to organize the debt, reschedule the debt. Mellon wasn't just good. He was a regular Alexander Hamilton. And on that level, don't let anyone smear him to you. Um, and work with the debtor nations. Uh, second, Harding oversaw the passage of a law called the Budget and Accounting Act of 1921, which gave the executive the power to oversee the budget. He hadn't had that before and created what we would know as the OMB, very important for the executive. 
he put through a tax cut, but it was a measly tax cut, frankly, because Congress was so divided. He refused a bonus, that is the beginning of an entitlement to veterans, very hard to do, and wrought a, an important compromise. He said to the veterans, we will build you hospitals instead. And he began putting natural sources that the government held, partly because of the war, strategic reserves into private hands. It didn't work out for Harding. First of all, I wasn't sure the polity was with him. You know, the Republicans lost large numbers of votes in 1922 midterms, 77 seats in the House, seven in the Senate. Uh, this Republican Bob LaFollette peeled off and started to form his own party, the Progressives. Where was Coolidge in this time? In the background observing. You know the story about Coolidge uh, as vice president. The lady sits next to him at a dinner at a place like the Union League and says brightly, I made a bet I could get you, Vice President Coolidge, to say more than two words tonight. And you know what Coolidge said. You lose. So not a big figure, a man of no in a city of yes, and matters are getting worse for Harding. It begins to emerge at first only to Harding in private, but then to the country that the great compromise with the veterans is not working out, that hospital construction was corrupt, the man appointed to build the hospitals for the poor vets was fraudulent and ended up in Leavenworth prison. The Harding oil privatization was a creepy joke. Uh, friends of friends got deals. It was not fair. Um, and Harding, despairing, told someone, I can deal with my friends, my damn friends. Excuse me. Uh, excuse me, I misspoke. I can deal with my enemies. That's fine. It's my friends, my damn friends who give me trouble. Harding was a bit sloppy and his friends were even sloppier. Today, these scandals are forgotten. Which student knows what Teapot Dome is? That's the, the oil scandal. But they mattered because they besmirched the Republican platform. If you are going to build hospitals for vets and deny them bonuses, those better be good hospitals. Otherwise, the argument for the bonuses is stronger. If you're going to say privatize oil or lease it out, that's technically what, what um, transactions like Teapot Dome were. Well, you better have fair auctions and not just give the oil to friends of friends. Well, then the opponent, if, if you cheat like that, well, then the argument of the opponent who says government should control the oil is that much stronger. So you see the platform was hurt. In any case, as you know, events took Harding off the stage. He passed away in the summer of 23. Coolidge was actually sworn into the presidency in August 23. And many wrote this silent cowl off as a kind of lame duck leftover. Um, they, they didn't expect he could do much. Uh, the progressives were on the march and the election was less than a year and a half away. You can count 23 to election 24. People thought Coolidge was afraid, but he wasn't. He said, I think I can swing it. Why was Coolidge confident? Because he knew what to do. And here his training as politician and attorney served him well. He would honor the promise of 1920. Often when we're caught in a scandal and become the successor, what we struggle to do is distance ourselves from the successor in every way, not just the man or woman, but also his plans, right? We write new plans, hire new people to show we're different. Coolidge didn't do that. He distanced himself from Harding and corruption. There was some investigation of the corruption, but he never dist himself, distanced himself from the platform. He said, we will, you voted for the platform, we will fulfill it to perfection. And he vowed to do that. The platform being the star was important. The platform said, keep cutting taxes. Coolidge was ready. He cut taxes more in 24 and in 26 when he had stronger majorities yet again. He got the rate to the 25 that they had all hoped for in the beginning, six or seven years ago. The program demanded budget cuts. Coolidge cut like a maniac. I don't know if you know, but Coolidge served 
67 months. And when he left the office of the US presidency, the budget was actually lower than when he came in. And you're like, well, is that nominal or real amity? Is that per capita amity? Uh, what do you say? No, it was nominal, real, and you don't need per capita. It, it works against you. It, it was lower, notwithstanding 4% growth of the economy in some years and significant growth of the population. He actually made the government smaller. And the only other president who approaches that in peacetime is Ike, actually. Um, but Coolidge's record is stronger in terms of the numbers. Um, Coolidge likened the budget cutting, which became harder and harder as the decade passed, of course, every year, to cheese pairing in his father's cheese factory. He met with General Lord, his advisor, and they planned out how they were going to cut every Friday the program, the agenda, the promise, the platform said, cut the debt. Under Coolidge, the debt went down by one third. And people could see he was serious. This bought him time. This bought him affection. Even people who didn't agree with the way he did things saw that he did what he said, and they respected that. The stunning evidence of that is the 1924 election, because in that election, which was indeed three-way with La Follette, the progressive, the Republicans, and the Democrats, Coolidge didn't just poll a plurality. He polled an absolute majority, beating the other two parties combined. That's very rare in American history, and it was a strong vote of confidence for him. Executing as he did, holding back, saying no, vetoing wasn't easy. Uh, and if you're going to veto, Coolidge vetoed 50 times. He vetoed veteran benefits. He vetoed what would become the Tennessee Valley Authority. Well, then you have to live virtuously, too. The Harding uh, crowd drank, and that was difficult because the law was prohibition. The president wasn't respecting the law, really. Coolidge White House was pure snow. Uh, the housekeeper, Mrs. Jaffray, in every regard, the housekeeper, Mrs. Jaffray, liked to go to the specialty shops, which were kind of expensive in her horse and carriage. And Coolidge advised her to go to Costco. Uh, no, it wasn't Costco, of course. It was the Piggly Wiggly, which was the Costco of his day. Because the White House ought to save more. And he also said she she lay, she generally laid out too much, too many hams. She, she, her spreads were too lavish, and and soon Mrs. Jaffray was gone, and Coolidge had replaced her with a fine housekeeper from New England who wrote down every expense in a little notebook, every single pot of mustard the White House bought, and saved money. And Coolidge would mark her up with his pencil, "Fine improvement," when she she cut the budget. How determined was Coolidge? He was so determined that his determination was even clear in his pets. Presidents name their pets to amuse voters for feature articles, right? So the pets are named Sox and Bo and Fala, President Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt's um, dog or Rex, or you, you know the names. Um, Coolidge named his pets for politics. He received a pair of twin lion cubs from a mayor in South Africa. What did he name his lion cubs? Budget Bureau and Tax Reduction. I kid you. That was because he didn't agree with the supply siders all the way, you know. He wasn't quite sure that if you cut the taxes, you always get more money out. It, 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 it kind of bothered him. So he wanted them to be even and they were twins and he fed them, he slide the steak across the floor, one steak for one line, right? They had to grow the same weight to show his equal commitment to budgeting and tax. That was his way of showing he was trustworthy to the voter. As the economy strengthened and workers saw that this deal worked out, that what the Republicans had done was good, um, he had time to make a few more points. One, and I know some in this room uh, know well, was his speech at the sesquicentennial of the Declaration of Independence um, in July 1926 in Pennsylvania. Um, here, I think, right? Yeah. Uh, that, in that speech, Coolidge... Uh, basically rebutted um, the modern progressives 
And he said, well, you know, government can do some things, but what matter more are what he called things of the spirit. Government can't control things of the spirit. Um, he also said about the, he sort of said, we don't need any more laws. It, you remember the line. He said, about the declaration, there is something exceedingly restful. If all men are equal, that is final. No advance, no pr proposition, no progress can be made beyond this proposition. There's no need for a thousand laws. We have to be more virtuous ourselves, but there's no need for all these laws. And people often debate, did he care more about faith or government in that, in that speech, the famous sesquicentennial speech honoring the July 4th anniversary? And I think if you look in the papers and look for the clues, you'll see the answer. That July 4th speech about the 4th of July, also his birthday, by the way, Coolidge gave on July 5. Why? Because July 4 was a Sunday. Very different world. Respect for faith. Um, Coolidge himself preached and practiced modesty. He said, let men in office substitute the midnight oil for the limelight. By the later 20s, this was hard because he was enormously popular. He, uh, he really did not want to... Um, appear vain or be vain uh and he didn't like that he the sense that he might become vain the senator selden spencer took him for a walk to cheer him up once towards the end of his presidency and they were on pennsylvania avenue and they were walking past the white house and uh senator spencer said to jolly coolidge what lucky dude gets to live in that white house with the pillars and coolidge said nobody they just come and go that is, we're all servants. And as you probably know, the uh, the important thing here, um, the, the real coup de grace by Coolidge, I think, was his decision in the summer of 1927. In 27, which is around the time you say you're going to run again, and Coolidge could run again, the Coolidges happened to be summering in South Dakota. And we described this in our Coolidge movie. And um, it happened that Gutzon Borglum, the sculptor of Mount Rushmore, was just getting started. And it's a measure of Coolidge's popularity that Borglum even said, we ought to have Coolidge up there with the greats, right? Can you believe it? But it's in the papers. It's true. In any case, Coolidge did bless Mount Rushmore, though I'm not sure he liked it. And too grandiose for him. But anyway, he blessed it. But he also made an announcement in the same week uh, from Rapid City, from the Rapid City High School, where he had this summer White House office. He handed out a little piece of paper and said, I do not choose to run again for president in 28. The press were shocked. Why would you give up? Why would you hurt the party in this way? Talk about platform. But Coolidge said it's important to change presidents from time to time in a republic. He wanted to be, if it was going to be Rushmore, he wanted to be more like George Washington than Theodore Roosevelt, though that was his choice. And he did withdraw and he left a very good legacy. I'll stop here except to say three things. One is that reminds us that platform matters. You can think of some other examples. So I hope both parties think about platform. Um, that platform two that platform can reduce the damage of scandal, which is such a distraction. Everyone's fallible, uh, and when we get all caught up in these scandals, we don't talk about the policies we need. And three um, that in the end, of course, character does matter. Coolidge mattered. It all could have wiped out in the twenties without Coolidge sort of seamlessly and gracefully taking up the responsibility when Harding passed. Uh, and I know uh, Mr. Miko in question time might ask me this question or you might, so I'll answer it uh, briefly. Uh, could there ever be a Calvin Coolidge today in the day of first impressions and the Kardashians and social media? And I will answer uh, one word um, in one word as Coolidge might have. I still think so, yes. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you, Amity. We have just a, a few moments uh, maybe to talk about a couple of other uh, items. And before we, we start, I, I have to say that uh, I've been here 17 years. And 17 years ago, people were saying, you have to have Amity Schlaes here. This is true. And so I want to apologize, some of those people are in this room, for taking this long, because that was a wonderful talk. So thank you, Amity. And I... And I want to start off a statement about the Union League and Calvin Coolidge, because when Calvin Coolidge was president, the Union League was at its absolute zenith in terms of political power and just power generally, maybe even more than during the Civil War. Um, and Calvin Coolidge was a great hero uh, to the Union League. And when he came here for the gold medal in 27, it was described by some that had been here since 1862 as the greatest moment in the history of the Union League of Philadelphia. So the Union League uh, certainly loved Calvin Coolidge. Um, your book, Coolidge, has great quotes everywhere. I want you to comment on one of them. I love this one. Coolidge made virtue of inaction. How? How is that a virtue not to do anything? What does business need? It doesn't need a perfect government, but it needs government not to get in the way. So Coolidge understood that inaction wasn't always laziness. It was rigorous restraint. He had to restrain his party, himself, human nature, from jumping in all the time. And there, there's, you know, there's some drama with that. Like he didn't jump in when there were natural disasters and he was criticized for being cold, you know, but it, jumping in has its cost as well. And I think TR and Coolidge are opposites and they both have wonderful strengths. It's, but Coolidge was, um, Coolidge ha had more humility and respect for the world. He didn't have the feeling he had to run everything. And he certainly knew he couldn't run the economy. It had to do with his, his great respect for delegation. He'd been governor. You have to delegate when you're governor, when you're a leader. And he believed the world runs itself if you let it. And it's self-deception to think you can do everything best. So I have a question, I'm gonna paraphrase it, but what can we learn from Coolidge today, specifically re regarding debt? And I'm gonna say national, state and personal, and anything in foreign policy that we can learn from Coolidge today? Well, um, debt doesn't matter apparently. So he was wrong. He was wrong. No, <laughs> debt mat doesn't matter until it matters. And so you think, I always think of Coolidge and sailing images. He was like a windsurfer. You think windsurfing looks easy, but when you try it, you see the core strength that requires it. it inflation um, doesn't, is like you're like on a craft and then you're, you're protected by the peninsula and then you come out into the ocean and the wind hits you hard. One day our currency will be challenged and then our debt will matter. We don't quite know how or by what means, but of course it will. So I think Coolidge understood that. At, in the period of Coolidge, there was the discipline of the international, of, of the gold standard and the international arrangements that, that forced the US, uh, pressured the US to, to reduce its deficits and move to surplus. Um, so I think. Uh, we're, we're in a kind of lazy, uh, drugged moment uh, where we don't realize that one day, of course, debts will matter um, and that property matters because when what happens when we deal with debts, we expropriate, right? Through inflation or through redistributive tax or by sheer confiscation of people's goods and that demoralizes people. Um, Coolidge believed property rights and personal rights are the same thing. And without having property rights, Americans wouldn't persevere in business. So, so uh, that's all true, even if we're in a moment right now where it doesn't feel true. We also have the relative advantage here that we're better than other countries. 
So people come here when we have troubles. I don't quite get that, but that's the way it is with the US dollar, for example. They buy dollars when the US has troubles because the US dollar is a safe harbor. That won't last forever. Um, and Coolidge is waiting with all his experience and wisdom to help us when we need him. So one last question um, before we part. Tell us about the Coolidge Foundation. Thank you for asking that. So uh, I think the great error we all made was in underrating the power of progressive education. And I, I grew up uh, in a progressive environment and I didn't think it was so terrible. I admired many progressive teachers and many uh, original ideas. However, younger people don't learn um, you don't get a balanced education anymore. It's too far from balanced. And now it's much worse. That is much less balanced education than it was five years ago. And five years ago is less balanced than it was 10 years ago. And all the way back, when you cannot imagine what young people are getting in school now. They, so the Coolidge Foundation seeks to fill the gap and we uh, educate young people about Coolidge and his values. He's a wonderful a vehicle, we don't say um, because his ideas were, were so strong, but they come at it through the man, Coolidge. And one specific example is the Coolidge Scholarship, which is a merit scholarship regardless of background. Regardless of background, it's a merit scholarship. Even children who do not get financial aid can win the Coolidge, the Coolidge Scholarship, or even poor children could win it. Um, and in order to apply for this scholarship, which 4,100 students do this year, the students must each write, let me see, 2.5 substantive responses to questions about Calvin Coolidge. I kid you not. So we have thousands of essays by kids um, about Calvin Coolidge. And the questions are kind of tough. For example, we would ask, uh, why did Coolidge believe lower taxes were the right thing to do? Didn't he care about the rich getting more of their share? And we make them do research for this. They have to read Coolidge's speeches and look at charts. So we, thereby we have uh, collected over 35,000 essays from American 16 year olds on Calvin Coolidge. But of course we also have programs too, but, but that's the point to, to come in and show kids there's another world. Coolidge's uh, and perhaps uh, just give them a glimpse. I don't believe you need to change every school all the way. You just need to give kids a glimpse of a possible other world of the kind they would find in a club or in a summer camp or in a fraternity. Amity, thank you for being with us. Thank you. 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 Program next uh, Wednesday. No, next not we next Wednesday. Kiro, help me out. Next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. We look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. <laughs>